Okay, so what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about performance. I'm going to talk a little bit about technology. So it's not going to be as exciting as going to Mars. <laughs> but we're going to try and make our computers go a little bit faster. Like, anybody here Formula One fans? Since this weekend, we're going to have Formula One. I'm a huge Formula One fan, too. Who would like to drive a Formula One car? <laughs> Do you think you would drive it well? No. <laughs> no. I can tell you, I've driven a Formula 3000 car, and it is really, really difficult. Some programming languages are a bit like that. I feel they're just really, really difficult to use. Like, I like lots of languages. I write C, I write C++, I write Java. I even write JavaScript at times for my sins in some assembler. And C++ is particularly hard. I find it's quite like driving some of these fast cars. There's so much you've got to learn. So I want to explore a little bit of the technology behind some of these and some of the things that I often find. I, I get brought into organizations and asked, like, what is your favorite language? What's your favorite platform for writing high-frequency trading applications? What will it be? They think, oh, yeah, yeah, you talk about Java, but it's probably really C, isn't it? It's probably C++. And whenever I give this answer, people are usually a bit shocked. They're like, Do Java, really? Not C? Not C++? Kind of crazy. And they'll follow it up with this question. And they're basically asking, why would you do low latency on a garbage collected environment? And at this stage, there's usually a bunch of older C, C++ programmers in the room, and they're looking at me like this. <laughs> And that's kind of typically what's going on in this, because you kind of feel a little bit like this. So let's cover a few things here. First of all, I want to set some context so we know what we're talking about. So to begin with, I want to be absolutely clear that a managed runtime is not always your best choice. It's not always even a good choice to do certain things. There are certain classes of problems that it just doesn't fit. So here's one very simple example. Latency arbitrage. If anybody's in finance, latency arbitrage is where you're trying to be the absolute fastest in the market. You're trading time at this stage. Would you be writing Java? Would you be writing C? Neither of those. That's not what people do in that space. What you're typically doing is you're programming hardware directly. You're doing FPGAs or ASICs in the switch itself right next to the exchange. So it's a very different kind of world. I'm not talking about that. I want to talk a bit about, like, are native languages faster than our managed runtimes? So by managed runtimes, I'm talking sort of Java, C Sharp, JavaScript, Go, lots of other interesting languages that we have in this space and what they can do. And when you look at it, like, which is actually faster? So is C faster than Java? Well, if I'm going to be honest about that, it is given enough time. And you're into this question here. It's like, you know, how much time have you? What access the skills have you? What resources have you? And also, what is the scope of your problem you're dealing with? Like, on a very large application, it's very difficult to get everything right and having access to all of the skills to do some of this. So let's break the problem down and look at where are we really looking at making things fast? Where are we wasting our time? Where are we saving our time? And for this, I want to talk about running software on CPUs accessing memory. I'm going to constrain the scope a little bit here. So I'm not talking about going to the network, going to disk. Some of those things are different, and they're different by language and by library. But if we're going to have a language war and debate all of that, we're really talking about programs running on CPUs accessing memory. Where do we spend our time, and where are the costs in this, and where can things be faster? So the CPUs are all awake to begin with. Can anybody answer the question of how long does it take to add two integers on a modern CPU. So you've got the integer values in registers. How long does it take to add two integers? Sorry? Depends. x86, 64-bit, typical Intel architecture or AMD. What do you think it would be? Yeah. Kind of getting there. Any other ones on that? One operation, doing a net. Yes. Yep, one cycle is actually your answer. So if you're on a three gigahertz CPU, that's a third of a nanosecond. It's a tiny amount of time, very, very tiny. 
If you're interested in any of this stuff, go to Anger Fogg's uh, blog. Really good thing, talking about how to optimize at a very low level. But let's look at something more interesting. Let's say I'm going to do that addition operation on an array of integers. So I've got a one gigabyte array of integers now. I'm going to go over it. I'm going to sum up every integer in that array. And I'm going to look at what is the average time per operation. And if you think each operation involves loading in the new value from the array, summing it with the value that you've already got, that you've totaled up so far, and storing that in a scalar and moving on. You have to do a number of things because you're having to increment the loop counter, you're fetching memory, you're storing memory. You're doing a number of different things at that stage. How long per operation to do that on average? Any guesses? Many cycles? What do we think? A few more? Lots more? Hundreds? Hundreds? Let's benchmark it and let's see what we get as an answer. It's 0.8 of a nanosecond per operation. And you're kind of thinking, hang on, there's many steps to that. It's not just one step. And if it's one cycle to do the addition, how are we at that? Like, really, is it one nanosecond per operation? Kind of interesting question. Well, let's look into what a modern CPU looks like internally. So, if you were sort of studying computer science back in school some time ago, you would have been taught there's an ALU, there's memory, so there's one arithmetic and logic unit. That's actually a very simplified view of really what's going on in the CPU. This is an Intel Haswell architecture. On this, we have got eight execution ports, of which we have many execution units attached to. And on the same thread, we have instruction level parallelism. So you can have one port is doing the addition that you've got for the summation going over the loop counter. Another port is doing the load of the next value all simultaneously, all pipelined. There's a lot of parallelism going on within our CPUs. So we're whizzing through this data incredibly fast. These things are quite complicated. So less than a nanosecond. So like typically, you're running at around two cycles per operation. Many things are happening at the same time. Now let's ask a much more interesting question. What if the access pattern is different? Let's say I'm not just going linearly through this array, adding up everything. If I want to go with, with different patterns, let's use different patterns, let's benchmark it. And like some of the patterns that are interesting is like, let's randomly go around the array. I'm going to have a random calculation that's not going to affect the work, but it's going to do the same amount of work just with a different pattern of access. I may do random within an operating system page, random across the whole heap. Make it even more interesting. Make it random where the next step you take is dependent on the value of the previous thing that you've read. That starts to make a difference to the logical pattern. Let's see what it does to the time. Now, each of these cases is the same amount of work. So if I start benchmarking them, I see that the sequential pattern, yep, less than a nanosecond to do that, going random within an operating system page and then moving on to the next operating system page is still only 2.7 nanoseconds. Going random around the whole heap, we're up to nearly 20 nanoseconds. But if we go random around the whole heap where we're dependent on the last value of red, we're up to 90 nanoseconds. So two orders of magnitude difference based upon the pattern of access, not the amount of work. So it's quite different in how we look at that. And you'll hear this term about pointer chasing. Low-level C programmers are very aware of it. Data-dependent loads is how process, processor designers talk about this is that you can't take the next step in memory till you can resolve the previous step that you need to take. So if I got a pointer to an object and it points to another object, I can't go to the second object to have resolved the first object. It's dependent on the first one. That's like the random stepping around. So it's a very interesting problem that we have to deal with. Why is the dependent one much uh, more expensive than the random pattern with no dependency? Our CPUs can do stuff in parallel, so we can have 10 concurrent cache misses at the same time. 
So like, we just go back and look at the figures. Like random heap and random dependent heap are quite different because we can have the CPU going off, randomly finding the next 10 values, and it amortizes the cost if it's dependent on the previous step. So just think of teams and people working. When everybody in the team is dependent on one other person, it chokes the team. It's the same thing in our algorithms. You'll find that the math appears in lots of different places. So what we've learned there is the actual computation is almost free. It's irrelevant. The patterns of access is what really matters to the performance of your code. And let's go in and we'll look at, well, what does this mean for the code that our compilers generate or the code that we write? So, a few things that are different about a managed runtime. One of the things is the runtime can make optimization decisions based upon data it's seen at runtime from your real application. A static compiler has to make all of its optimization decisions up front without seeing your data. Now, there are compilers where you can do a profile-guided build, run that build with some test data, then rerun the compiler, and it'll optimize more for that set of data. But that training set of data better be exactly like what you're going to see at runtime, otherwise it'll optimize wrongly. You can do that. Very few people do it and do it well. So you tend to not do that. We just rely on normal static optimization. So our runtimes have a lot more information. But also, our runtimes have another big trick up their sleeves is they can take bets. And it's OK to be wrong. So if anybody here is a fan of Agile programming, what do we know about Agile is that we don't know all the answers up front. We're going to learn more information as we go. And that information we learn later is much more valuable than having a guess up front and being wrong. Our runtimes can do the same thing. Is they can put off stuff. They can take bets. They can have an attempt at something. And if it's wrong, it's OK. Feel fast and go again. Managed runtimes have these options. So let's look at some real concrete examples. Like our code, we can have methods. And we've got lots of branches inside our methods. So our if statements are branches. Switch statements, for loops, while loops, these are all branches. So I've got a block of code at the top. I have an if condition with some code inside it. And then I've got some code afterwards. Remember the sequential access pattern. If you go sequentially through something, it's much faster. The reason that is actually faster is for a number of uh, things. One of them is we have hardware prefetchers. If you go through something with a pattern of access, the hardware can go ahead and prefetch the stuff, having it ready for you before you actually need it. So it primes the pipeline. And so if you go through any code linearly, it will be faster because code is just data like anything else. So our compiler could look at this code and think, well, this condition is always taken. So I'm going to let out the code one way. Or I may think this code condition is hardly ever taken. I'll let out the code differently. Our static compilers don't know that. We can hint that if we want to. So in C or C++, I can hint a branch and say that this branch is likely to be taken or it's unlikely to be taken. Now imagine doing that across a really large code base getting everything right. It's incredibly difficult to do. But if we're measuring at runtime, it's different. So we have a block of code here. We then hit the condition. We have another block of code. And we have the final block of code. Now, what if this branch is really unlikely to be taken? Well, it would make much more sense to lay out block A followed straight away by block C with an uncommon trap for block B if it's ever taken. That is a much more efficient layout. The runtime can do that. It can generate that assembly code. It may choose to not even compile B and just leave it running in the interpreter, because it's so infrequently executed. Like, what would be a good example of this? Like, if this is null, do a special case. Very often in our code, we do lots of error checking, where things should hardly ever trap. They're just there for protection. And they're good to have them there, but we don't want to take the expense of all of that. We also have subtle branches in our code. So if i is greater than 7, I'll use a. Otherwise, I'll use b. So let's say we have no idea what i is, and 50-50, it's going to be greater than 7. 50-50 is going to be less than 7. There's no real way to deal with that. Our branch predictors may get that right, may get it wrong. 
they're pretty good generally, but they're not good with truly random versions of this. But if it was high 90% likelihood one or the other, the branch predictor is what we want to rely on. But things like x86 have special instructions, like CMove, which is a conditional move without a branch in the processor. That is really good in the case where something is unpredictable. It'll be faster than the unpredictable case. So which instruction do you generate? If you can measure your code at runtime, you can see what sort of data you're really throwing at it, and the compiler can generate the right thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do that. Methods. We inline stuff at times. We put calls from one block to another. So here we've got a method foo. Inside there, it's got a bunch of code, and then it calls bar in the middle. So we've got a block of code at the top with the call to bar. It has to jump out to code somewhere else, execute bar, return back again, and then do the code afterwards. That is not a very nice pattern to go, plus we've got the function call overhead. Now, what if this code is really hot? We do it very often. The compiler can compile up block A, and then just inline the code for bar, fuse it in without even taking the function call overhead, and then do block B. Nice and linear through that. That would make our code much faster. Yes, we can do this in C. We can do it in C++ as well. But again, we have to tell where we want it to happen. And we're often wrong. Also, we don't want to inline everything because we have a small cache for instructions. We have only 32 kilobytes of cache for instructions in our CPUs. And if we make our program too big by inlining a lot, we end up with code bloat and we destroy in the cache. So it's a balancing act. We want to inline where it's worthwhile and not inline where it's not worthwhile. Can you guess that right? Over hundreds of thousands of lines of code, every word should be done. It's an interesting challenge to try and do that. I've seen people attempt it. I've seen it happen in the Linux kernel and get it wrong in many places. And they had to back out the changes. And some smart people were writing that code. Like, to steal a quote from Cliff Click, inlining is the optimization in most code, but knowing where to do it is the real trick. Like, Cliff done his entire PhD. Anybody who doesn't know Cliff Click wrote the hotspot compiler, JIT for uh, Sun, back at the end of the 90s, had become the C2 compiler. It was the main reason Java got fast in the first place. And he spent his entire PhD on working out when do I inline stuff versus where do I not inline stuff. And he came up with this concept of the sea of nodes, which does a cost-based calculation on the ideal places to do it and where not to do it, because there's lots of other things come with that. Because once you inline, you increase visibility. You can then apply other optimizations. But you don't want to do it if you're going to end up hurting. So loops, another good example. We spend over 80% of the time in our code in loops. There's lots of studies that show that. So we want to optimize some loops. But which loops? Not all loops. A simple technique we can do to optimize a loop is to unroll it. So rather than take the loop overhead for every iteration, we can unroll it to be 4, 8, or 16 times per iteration. We can do some neat things with vectorization on top of that. But where do we do it? We've got to pick the right places to do it. And we can go even further, where sometimes we have certain instructions that would require or just even operations that we do that require many different instructions. Some CPUs have specialized forms of those that we can call directly. Like bit count be an example. If you've programmed any data structures like tries, you have to count the number of bits in the word quite often. That takes tens of instructions to do it. But if you're running on a CPU that's got SSE 4.2 instruction set enabled, you have the pop count instruction. The runtime can query. What CPU am I running on? Oh, fine. I can issue that instruction instead. It's a single cycle instruction. Now, you can compile for that platform, but then you're targeting a platform rather than working out what you're running on at runtime and then generating the right instructions. Objects are a really fascinating one. And this is the one where when you come to a managed runtime versus say something like C++ is, when I'm writing C++, I wish I have this feature all the time. And this is to deal with polymorphism. So like my draw method on a shape is polymorphic. Each shape can implement a different draw method. A circle draws itself one way. A square draws another way. 
polygon another way? Do you get multiple implementations? Which one do you call? Now, quite often, in many cases in our code, we only deal with one type at a call site. And where call site, meaning to the line of code that's calling this, you may call that method somewhere else in your code. That's a different call site. At that call site, you may only have one implementation of that polymorphic type. It's known as monomorphism. With monomorphism, we can get rid of the virtual dispatch. We can even inline the specific implementation at that call site. And we can deal with this at runtime by knowing how many types do we deal with at that given call site. If there's two types, we can go bimorphic, just add an if statement. Go into three or four different types, depending on which runtime. You can then go megamorphic, and you have to use a jump table and resolve at runtime which method I'm calling, and that takes a cost. In C++, if you use the virtual keyword, you take that cost all the time. C sharp, unfortunately, even though it's a managed runtime, it doesn't have this optimization that Java has. And JavaScript also has the same optimization, but C sharp doesn't have this optimization. It's known as class hierarchy analysis. So we've got that one call site. We may have another call site somewhere else. Different method we're calling could be polymorphic, could not be polymorphic. But what's really fascinating about class hierarchy analysis is that not only can we determine is there one type used at a thing or only two types or whatever it happens to be, we can also find the most common type. So one of the really nice optimizations right back from the small talk days was a thing called inline caching. So if you find at that call site, 90% of your types are one particular type and the less than 10% are some other type, you can cache the implementation of the really common one at the call site and benefit really well. So lots of quite cool stuff. So hopefully that surprised some people a little bit that our runtimes can do cool stuff. Yeah. A question? Mm -hmm. Sorry, we're, we're recording. We'll have the questions at the end, but. We'll take the question at the end. There's many types of polymorphism, so overloading is, or is overriding at that case is a different type from overloading versus parametric. There's many different ways. I'm talking particularly about overriding polymorphism in this case. So garbage collection is the other really interesting one. So people will say, well, garbage collection, kind of useful feature, big runtime performance hit. How can something that's a managed runtime ever compete with a native language in that? So let's look a little bit into what garbage collection actually does and what do we need to care about. I want to start off by stealing a quote from the singer Billy Joel, where he said that only the good die young. This very much applies to our objects. The shorter an object lives, the less it costs. This is pretty much standard across most runtimes and most garbage collectors. So very short-lived objects are very cheap to deal with. Longer-lived objects become more expensive. And this observation that most objects don't actually live very long is known as the weak generational hypothesis, discovered quite some time ago. This resulted in what are known as generational garbage collectors. And the generational garbage collectors rely on the fact that most objects don't live very long, which is kind of a, an interesting feedback cycle. Now, because we've got uh, generational garbage collectors, we should encourage this even more that most things live for a very short time. Unfortunately, if you do a lot of functional programming, some of the data structures in those go against the weak generational hypothesis and really torture our garbage collectors, but that's a separate subject if anybody wants to talk to me about it afterwards. So what does a generational garbage collector look like when it lays out its heap? So typical one here for Java is we tend to have multiple generations where we've got a young generation or a new generation where things are capped for a period of time. If objects survive, they're copied to and from survivor spaces for a while. And if they live long enough, they get promoted to the old generation where they're tenured. So this is the typical layout we have of a heap. But before we come back into the detail of this, let's do a little segue into what modern hardware looks like. So our typical servers these days are two socket CPU servers. There's single socket, there's four socket, there's eight socket, there's various other ones. But the most common by far is a two-socket server because it's the best 
price performance point. We have multiple cores inside each socket. The sockets are connected via, in Intel's case, the quick path interface. AMD used to be hypertransport. They've now got a new transport with their latest processors. But we have a separate bus that connects these, these sockets, and it's got a cost. So we're looking at 40 nanoseconds to go across the bus and back again, plus there's other costs on top of that. So if you're talking to memory that's remote on the other socket, it has a lot of cost. So are we aware of the differences in the location of our memory? Even within a socket these days, this goes further. So this is a Broadwell EX CPU where we've got groups of cores and groups of caches. This is a big scary picture. And you notice the rings on the left and the right. And between them, in the middle, those gray boxes at the top and the bottom are network switches on a CPU. This is not even across CPU sockets on the same machine. This is within the same die on the CPU. And the costs are different depending on where they are. These are known as NUMA regions, non-uniform memory access. So not all memory is equal to access. Do we know where our memory happens to be? Do we know what we're using? Typically not. But let's look at what our allocators can do and how we deal with this. So if you allocate a new object, it will be allocated out of the Eden region of your machine. Each thread gets what's known as a TLB. Uh, translation, uh, no, trans I'm mixing up my processors now on the high level a thread local allocation buffer, and you allocate out of that. This is very cheap. So if you allocate like an iterator on a loop, it'll be allocated out of here. You'll use it, and then there's no reclamation with that. So it's very cheap at that sort of stage. When you've used up a TLB, you need to get another one, and you move on. Now, what if those TLBs are allocated by an allocator that's NUMA aware? It can allocate you the buffer next to your thread where it's running. It becomes nice and cheap. Not so easy to do in C or C++. And so there's various other things we can be aware of. Like if things have been living for a while, they then get copied to the survivor spaces to go to and fro between those and eventually get promoted. Where the survivor spaces are is interesting. We want to compact the data together to keep it within the same operating system pages, the same cache lines. Again, we can get certain benefit for that and apply certain parallel algorithms. Lots of fun stuff there if you want to talk to me about it afterwards. Ultimately, then, we will keep objects longer, and they'll go to tenured. Notice how I say that the, only the, the good die young. If something is kept around, it goes through all this copying backwards and forwards through survivors. It then goes into the old generation where we use different algorithms again for managing it with lots of complex data structures for doing this. But we can do a few other good things. Typically, in the old generation, we can do concurrent compaction, which I'll touch on, and things like string deduplication. So the same string value is showing up in multiple places. We can just reuse that as part of our garbage collection cycle, which will minimize our footprint. And it can be quite a common thing. So let's look at compaction. So I've got a region of memory. I've used up a bunch of things in it, and now I need to do a garbage collection. And this is where I really hate what we do as an industry when it comes to naming. So we talk about garbage collection. We do not collect any garbage at all. It's badly misnamed. We harvest objects that are still around. Our industry has this terrible problem of naming things badly. I, I like to rant about this just for a second. We do this with lots of different things. Like, anybody ever thought of random access memory is terribly named? I don't want random memory. I want an exact piece of data I stored so I can get it back again later. Random is the wrong thing. We should have arbitrary access memory. That's we should name things correctly. Software maintenance. We don't grease and oil and maintain software. We have to adopt it when we have new requirements. We think about these different things. So I'll sort of stop on the garbage collection renting for a second. Look at how some of this stuff works. So let's say as we harvest our objects, what do we do? We work out which objects are still reachable that need to be retained. And we copy them to another region, and that frees up the region. So we may have used all of this memory at some stage. These bits are the bits that are still relevant, the bits that are still in use. When we collect memory, we tend to do a depth-first copy. So if this was a, a data structure, like an array or a hash table that was pointing to lots of other objects, 
we would copy all of the children first, and we put them all together, all neatly compacted, and then we copy across the main array itself. This has some interesting benefits. Like everything now is compacted into operating system pages, compacted into cache lines. If you iterate this data structure, it's much faster through memory because now it's a linear scan, not jumping around. So we get these really interesting performance benefits from using our garbage collectors and how they compact our memory. But there's an elephant in the room with garbage collectors, and this mostly comes down to the implementations. As they move things around, most of the collectors have to stop the world. And they stop the world because you don't want to be accessing an object when it's getting moved underneath you. So they stop all of your threads that are running is the typical approach to that. We try to make this better by making these pauses as short as possible. One example is now the new G1 garbage collector. It organizes the heap into smaller regions and collects the regions with the least garbage in them. I see the most garbage in them, the least number of objects that's in there. That's why it's called the garbage first collector. And it breaks the problem up into chunks, but it still stops the world. Like, can we do things to make it more efficient? Well, there are truly concurrent garbage collectors that don't stop the world. Azul Zing C4 is a really good example of how we can have a collector that will not stop your application, even for the young generation to pause. So these things exist. It's commercial, unfortunately, so you have to pay for it. But sometimes it's worth it for what you're getting back in return. We're also getting new collectors coming in open source. So the Shenandoah collector, which is an interesting implementation of the Brooks barrier, which allows us to collect concurrently without stopping our application again. But it's not a generational collector. So if we look at it like memory management, if we do the manual versus the managed, it's not easy to pick a clear winner. On the managed side, we have some costs that we need to care about. Garbage collection comes with associated costs. We need data structures to store all of the state of the system. We need an appropriate implementation to run. And it's got a lot of overhead for that. And different collectors in different ways end up with more costs. So we've got to be aware of that. On the native side, it's not as easy either. Like, Moloch is quite cheap. Freeing an object is where the real cost comes from. It's always the case. And particularly if you're going across threads. So once you start going across threads in a native implementation, it becomes incredibly expensive and difficult to deal with. But what's interesting is where is Next for garbage collection? With things like C, we can inline our objects. So we can put a structure inside a structure. This makes it compact, makes it easy to deal with. In C sharp, we can control this to a point. But again, you're down to your guessing. Is it the right thing to be doing? How do you know the places you should be doing it? We're now starting to see garbage collectors come out of research where they're working at a runtime which objects should be co-located, which ones make up true aggregates in our domain model. They can be co-located together and get the performance of allocating our models in the right place and moving them all together. So last section here. I want to talk about algorithms and design. So I've covered some of the lower level stuff. Let's think about a question here. What is the most important thing we need to having good performance? Anyone guess? What, different opinions. What do you think? If you're going to design a system, what is the most important thing you can do to have good performance? <coughs> Data structures, possibly. Algorithms? Simple design? I would argue it's time. All of those things require time to do the right thing and do it well. Who's worked on projects where they're sat around thinking, I've got too much time? Doesn't really happen. Time's a really difficult thing to try and get. I, I love this quote. If I had more time, I'd have written a shorter letter, originally from Blaise Pascal, often attributed to Mark Twain. And this is so much the case about code. We can go back, we can revisit, we can refine code, we can make it smaller, neater, more elegant, faster in many ways. But we need the time to do that. So like your typical project, you'll do lots of these sorts of things, like to make stuff fast. Like, does it matter if, say, C code can be 10% faster than C sharp or Java code if you're doing the same piece of work multiple times? 
the duplication blows it all out. There's lots of other interesting things, and particularly one of the strongest points I like to make on this is API design. This is something we can influence every day. I keep seeing API designs that design in bad performance. It's a really difficult problem to deal with because most people get no background or education in the impact of their API designs. And what they do is they impose ways of behaving on their users rather than enabling them and giving them the choice. But the summary of some of this is like, if you have a really large code base, it's really difficult to do everything right. We have to apply all these techniques and be able to get them right across the whole board. I'll talk very briefly about a project I've been working on for a while, Aaron. It's a messaging system. So we were tasked with building a messaging system that would be as fast as the fastest systems out there with some other features that would be there and enabled. And we built the first prototype in Java. And we're going against commercial uh, native implementations in C and C++. We were able to build a system that was faster than any of the native implementations, and we did it in Java first. We've since ported it to other languages. So how did we make it faster? Well, it was a case of working on the algorithms. The algorithms matter so much more, but you need the time to do that. It's not the native implementation. But a really surprising thing came out for me was the concept of time to performance. So if you write something in C, and try to make it perform. You write it in Java, you write it in C Sharp, you write it in many different languages. Ultimately, you can make some of them faster than others, but in which one can you get the really good performance quickly in your own development time? And for us, Java was by far the fastest to get to a point where we had really reasonable performance. We're not the only ones. I've talked to a number of people in the space who have been building complicated stuff, and the C Sharp compiler team is another good example. The compiler for C-sharp was written in C++. They decided to rewrite the compiler in C-sharp itself. The team didn't want to do this to begin with, and eventually they did it. To their surprise, they now have a cleaner, more elegant code base that's easier to work with, and it's faster. And the reason it's faster is they were able to focus on some of the more important things. Like, what are some of these more important things? It's like having elegant models, choosing the right codecs, and what do I mean by choosing the right codecs? Again, here's another example of our industry doing the wrong thing. So Google protocol buffers is a codec. It's not a protocol. Again, badly named. Like, you'll hear from a number of people about writing stuff in JSON and XML and all those sorts of things. And you'll probably even hear from other speakers here telling you that JSON is a perfectly fine language for doing stuff in. Frankly, I think they're full of it in some ways. <laughs> you really need to do binary data structures. And usually the people who say don't do binary data structures do not have enough experience in, in binary data structures to do them well. They're way more efficient, they're way more elegant, they're actually easier to debug and reason about and program against. But we have some things in our industry that we need to get much better at. So then to think about what are your data structures, what are your algorithms as well, and also what's your level of mechanical sympathy? What is your stack doing and do you know how to use it well? Also, as we go more and more concurrent, there are many algorithms that do not work unless you have a garbage collector. Knowing the ownership of memory makes some models much easier to implement and many algorithms much easier to implement in doing this. So I'm going to wrap up here quickly in closing. Let's think about what does the future hold in this space. Is anyone old enough to remember the arguments about assemblers versus compilers? I can remember this. I lived through some of this, where people would argue that we should be writing assembly code because compiled code is too slow and we can't keep up. And I've seen people hand rolling assembler code to do games and do other things. And then our programs become so complex that no individual can beat a compiler over a large code base. We are starting to see this now with managed runtimes and dealing with it. So here's a nice little example of this. This is not water. This is a real-time rendered image that's multiple stories high. And what's kind of fascinating is you can go over and interact with it in real time. And it can change between being a waterfall. It can change between being fish, being different things. What language do we think this is written in? Java? Nope. 
not JavaScript. It's a language called impromptu. It's like a variant of Scheme with a real-time garbage collector and some intrinsics for the graphics. Designed originally for music, can be applied to other things. We're starting to get really cool research languages coming out and some of this stuff going forward. We can build incredibly complex things. So kind of think about where are you going to spend your time on your future projects? Are you going to keep having arguments and wars about languages? Or are we going to look at some of the other things? And on that, I'll thank you very much and take questions of time. Can we have a round of applause?